beyond our everyday experience. At the center of the ice sheet, the ice is more than three kilometers thick, or about 30 Statues of Liberty, from ground to torch. But even as the ice sheet thins towards the edges, much of it still moves in these long, deep outlet glaciers, bringing walls of ice to meet the ocean. I've made a career of studying the Greenland ice sheet, and it is definitely my passion. But so much of the work I do is really made possible thanks to satellites. It's only with satellites that we can see ice this scale. So from my desk, I've watched glaciers without names retreat by kilometers, and waters open up that probably haven't been exposed for thousands of years. But there is something that is difficult to see from space. People. Uh, <laughs> even though I spent a couple field seasons in the Greenland, I've had pretty little interaction with the Greenlandic people, and I don't think I knew what I was missing, but luckily that started to change a little bit. This last June, I was at a conference in Alulasat. Uh, this is a town with a great native population, an even larger sled dog population, a strong <laughs> fishing industry, and also a burgeoning tourist industry. And that tourist industry there, largely because of Jakob Sabin Glacier, or Sermek Kujelstrat in Greenlandic. Topping out at more than 16 kilometers per year, this is the fastest flowing glacier in the world. And the icebergs it calves off float kilometers down the fjord to sit on the ocean sill next to town. So you can see them, they're stunning, sitting there quietly, bergy bits passing by, little, you can barely see the, the bird under the cliff there. Um, it's a common tourist activity to go boating among these icebergs in the Arctic midnight. And with a great stroke of luck, which is a whole other story, I ended up on this wooden fishing boat with one other scientist and Jan, our boat captain. Jan grew up in northern Greenland and has lived in Alulasat for a couple of decades. And I could not help but ask him about how things had changed. And by things, I meant the landscape, the outdoor activities, the things that I knew were affected by climate change. And his answers weren't a surprise. The winter sea ice is getting thinner. It's harder to run their sled dogs. The winters are getting shorter, maybe a little too short. And even the nature of the things we were on that boat to see, icebergs, had changed. I could tell you what that change looks like from space. Uh, Jakob Sabin used to have this long floating ice tongue that would calve off big icebergs. Not the size of small states, but nonetheless big icy beasts. But since the early 2000s, that ice tongue has broken up. And even though the icebergs that come off of Jakob Sabin are still large, probably most of them pale in comparison to many of the icebergs of the past. Um, and those changes hadn't gone unnoticed by Jan, who commented on the changing character of the neighborhood iceberg forest. But what really struck me that night, um, and was kind of a punch to the stomach and has continued to pull at my heartstrings, is not so much the comments about what changed, but how he talked about them. Jan talked about climate change by saying before climate change and after climate change. He talked about it like a life-altering event. He talked about climate change the way we in the US often talk about before 9-11 and after 9-11, a common experience that changed our consciousness and changed our activities and how we go about our lives. Um, commonly, when I'm doing outreach talks, people ask me, is it too late? And I've prepared this slide to tell them that there's not a black and white line, but instead it's a gray scale, and every day that we're doing something, we're helping to avoid the darker end of the scale. But talking to Jan has me rethinking this a little bit, because talking to him, it really felt like he and the other people in Greenland had already fallen off of the climate change cliff. So what I've been thinking is maybe climate change isn't this grayscale, but a series of little cliffs. This one, the extinction of a species. This one, raging wildfires in the western US or in Australia. This one, thinning sea ice around Alulasat and Jakob Sabin Glacier. So maybe instead what we need to ask ourselves is what is the cliff that we're trying to avoid? And then we need to gather together, and we need to get out there, and we need to make sure to avoid that fall. <coughs> Thanks.